um, one of the issues that has been preoccupying me in recent years has been, uh, both as a, as a theorist and scholar and as a practitioner, has been the question of machine agency. Um, of course, I've been obsessed with this idea of uh, exploring interactions between technology and, and live performance for a very long time. But recently, I've gotten particularly interested in the concept of the robot as an autonomous agent. Uh, the robot who becomes human as its maker is a trope that recurs throughout the history of science fiction, of course, starting, as we all know all too well, with the robot in Karel Chapek's R.U.R., which famously introduced the term of robot to the world in 1920. In recent years, and with accelerating pace over the past decade, a growing number of theatrical productions and live performance events have incorporated real robots, uh, and such performances invite us to ask at what point a human-crafted mechanical prop acquires its own agency, Pygmalion style, and becomes a performer of its own right. So today, I'm going to use this question to structure a brief overview of the way robots are deployed in theatrical performance. And I'll be drawing both on the recent history of robotic performance, and in some cases not so recent, going back to the 70s, but mostly more recent. Um, and in, and on, in addition, on my own experiments and performance uh, with robotics in the classroom, using my dear friend Zeebzob, who some of you have had the opportunity to meet in my office, and if you haven't, stop by and say hi. Uh, Zeebzob is a Darwin OP robot, and you'll be seeing and hearing from him or her, depending on what character he or she is playing in a moment. Um, the Darwin OP is an open source robot that was developed through a consortium of universities and then sold commercially toward the, by the Korean robot uh, company Robotus. But the, the uh, model, the, the designs and, and the code is all available online if you wanted to build your very own Zeebzob. <laughs> so uh, I acquired Zeebzob about five years ago uh, from a colleague uh, who has since retired in the School of Engineering uh, and have a lot of, a lot of fun with him. And uh, in order to pursue this investigation, uh, I uh, worked with a graduate student uh, who works with me in ideas, through ideas for creative exploration, a music composition student, uh, who developed a bridge between the software built into Zeebzob. Zeebzob has, is a computer, you know, has running Linux. Um, and the programming environment that I use, which is Max MS, uh, MSP Jitter. Uh, and then I created in Max a tool to allow my students, who are tend not to be th uh, computer students, but acting students and playwrights and performers, to, um, to animate the robot without needing to get into programming. And also to basically use Zeebzob as another output device for, for Max. So to be integrated fully with any audio, sound, video, anything. Um, so. So we'll, uh, I, I will be bringing out Zeeb when appropriate uh, to illustrate some of the concepts that I've been looking at. All right, so uh, my talk is gonna be focusing on, not wanting to see this, all right, uh, five different modes of robotic control which uh, create a continuum from human-centered agency to robot-centered agency. So we'll be progressing through these. And there is, from a theatrical and artistic standpoint, there's absolutely no hierarchy implied. Uh, but from a theoretical standpoint, this, this quest towards the Pygmalion-like uh, autonomous robot is, is exemplified through this, this progression. So the first of these concepts uh, is puppeted robotic performance, which is by far the most common way that robots are controlled right now in performance. When a live operator controls the robot's actions in real time within a theatrical context, it enters into precisely the same relationship with this operator that a puppet does with its puppeteer. All right? But unlike conventional robots, the magic of technology makes it possible for the robotic puppet to be untethered physically from the human puppeting it. In addition, designers have extraordinary freedom to design interfaces that manipulate these robotic puppets. So somebody can control a puppet with a joystick, tablet interface, or mimic conventional puppet control such as uh, handheld puppets or marionettes. The options are limited entirely by the creator's imagination. 
Uh, so as I said, a lot of the vast majority of robots used on stage so far have been puppeted. So for example, in 1909, there was a production of A Midsummer's Night Dream at Texas A&M University with seven remote controlled drones, one pizza-sized -size, air robot, and six fist-sized uh, fist E-flight mini helicopters who were cast as the fairies. Uh, one of the most uh, critically successful uh, examples of robotic theater, uh, which, with which I'm sure many of you are familiar, at least indirectly, because it got a fair amount of press at the time, was Elizabeth Merriweather's Hedatron, which was written specifically for puppeted robots and human actors. And this play was first produced a little over 10 years ago in 2006 uh, by the uh, Le Fer Corbusier Theater Company in New York, using robots created by Meredith Chang and Cindy Jeffers of the arts robot collective Bot Matrix. And so we see that image to the left. Uh, and it was, the show was restaged in 2011 by the Side Show uh, Theater Company in Chicago using robots designed by David Hyman, uh, Lizzie Stozel, and Bruce Phillips, and constructed by members of the Chicago Area Robotics Group. And there's, there it is on the right. Both the Chicago and New York productions assigned a separate operator to control each of the five robots. So there was a human actor for each robot. Um, and in both cases, the design, as you can see, exaggerate the robot's mechanical nature for comic effect, with the, uh, the Frey Corbusier production embracing uh, a low-budget makerspace aesthetic, and the Sideshow production a slightly slicker steampunk aesthetic. During one of the curtain calls, the Sideshow performers exploited and highlighted the real-time control of the robots when the cast invited the lead actress's boyfriend on stage so that the robots could wish him a happy birthday. Uh, and the boyfriend turned the tables on her by having the robots assist him in making a surprise marriage proposal. And this is actually, or at least was, available on YouTube uh, for everybody to see. Uh, one of the most complex and by far ex most expensive robotic puppets to date is the 20 foot tall, uh, whoops, there it is, oh, this is the, uh, I'll show you. I was, I'll show you a little bit of this, so you can see. This is the marriage proposal. So there, there are the robots. So, uh, as I was saying, uh, one of the most commercially, probably by far the most commercially successful and expensive uh, robotic puppets to date is a 20-foot tall gorilla created in 2013 by the animatronic company uh, Creature Technology for a musical adaptation of King Kong uh, at the Regent Theatre in Melbourne. Actually, this wasn't, I misspoke, this wasn't especially commercially, it didn't do super well commercially, their previous uh, walking with Dinosaurs was phenomenally commercial, but it was definitely the largest and most expensive uh, of these companies' uh, productions. Um, and uh, Elizabeth Joachim has, has, talked at, has written at length about, about this company and their use of robots. Um, Sonny Tilders, Creative Technologies Creative Director, led the design and construction process, and Pete Wilson, the, pro uh, the production's puppetry director, coordinated a team of 14 puppeteers. Kong is a hybrid of a puppeted robot and a gigantic, manually operated marionette. His facial expressions are animatronic. Two ostrich puppeteers use real-time voodoo controls, which the production's director, Daniel Kramer, describes as being like the ultimate Nintendo Wii pad to drive servo motors in Kong's eyes, eyebrows, eyelids, nose, lips, jaw, neck, and shoulders. And a third offstage puppeteer remotely navigates Kong along a four-ton track and trolley system to move him across the stage. And then finally, a team of 11 circus-trained aerialists dressed in black, dubbed the King's Men, pull and swing on a series of counterbalanced cables to manipulate Kong's limbs in full view of the audience. As Kramer puts it, the King's Men are wonderful reminders that much of the magic of puppetry is seeing the puppeteers, the double vision of the creature's life and the human beings creating that illusion. Uh, now, creature technology was compelled to supplement the animatronic elements of its King Kong with manual, albeit super-scaled, marionette controls 
to overcome some of the limitations of current robotic technology. The range of motions produced by servo motors that drive most robots is much more restricted than that of the simplest handheld puppet, rod puppet, or marionette. Moreover, the precise control with which servo motors snap a robot's joints into position uh, uh, produces the same inertia of matter in robots that von Kleist in On the Marionette Theater described uh, as afflicting human performance and that Kleist contrasts to the natural grace of marionettes singing, uh, swinging freely with the force of gravity uninhabited, inhibited by consciousness and affectation, as we all are familiar with that essay. Um, and this reminds me actually of when um, um, uh, Basil Twist, the brilliant puppeteer, was doing a residency here and uh, talking about uh, how, why he disliked hand puppets and why he much preferred, well, cloth, he's done brilliant work just with a piece of cloth or with marionettes. It's a very Kleistian kind of argument. Um, so, and everybody's clear on the way, you know, servos work. So you actually send them a digital number and they snap into exactly that degree of rotation. So you always, you have this incredible precision, which is completely free from the forces of gravity and nature. Um, examples such as creature technologies King Kong, where multiple operators simultaneously control different parts of a single puppet or robot function, as I'm sure many, it occurred to many of you, uh, much like Bunraku puppetry. Uh, the multiple, uh, multiple operators were collectively as performers to create a single performance. We should recall, moreover, that this kind of collaborative performance isn't unique to uh, either robotics or puppetry more generally. For example, we all recall the open theaters, you know, production in 68 of The Serpent, where you have all these different actors creating The Serpent and many other open theater style exercises that do the same thing. All right, so this is robotic puppetry. I'll show you just a couple of images of um, creature technologies work to see that. You're a puppet maker, they think little puppets. And then you say, well, actually, I've got this little shed that's 3,000 square meters with you know, 40 full-time staff, and we make our puppets the size of your house. And then it sort of starts to put in perspective. This is Sonny's little shed in West Melbourne. That is impressive. The world headquarters of global creatures. This is the neck of the puppet. Got the body on my right hand here, which does the up and down and the twist. It was the 80s when Sonny got his start on some of So the Walking with Dinosaurs was a huge commercial, a gargantuan commercial success, and that is 100% puppeted. You can see this total, totally fun toy. And I'll show you a little bit of King Kong. His shoulders and his wrists to give him a hyper-realistic illusion of being real. There is a lot riding on the... All right. Okay. So the second mode that I'd like to talk about, I call reanimated performance. All right. Uh, so while uh, manual puppeteers manipulate their robots in real time, robot puppeteers have the option of recording messages they send to the robot to replay later. The digital instructions that the robot receives and executes will be identical regardless of whether it receives them in real time or after a delay, um, or after a delay, or whether it's receiving them for the first or 100th time. In other words, if I'm a robot and I get a number that says move my elbow to position 20, I don't know or care whether that number was, was actually generated by a person in real time or was coming from a file and playback. It's exactly identical to me, right? Um, so um, the situation is similar to that of a video or audio recording of a live performance, but with a crucial ontological difference. When we watch a performance on video, the performer's body is absent. Only an image is present to us. And a video image is radically, a radically different kind of thing, possibly, if you don't believe philosophy under. Um, no, even he acknowledges the ontology, the phenomenology is what he questions, um, than a human body. By contrast, Every time we send a previously recorded instruction to a robot, a real robot performs the action. So not just from the robot's perspective, but from our perspective, we are seeing a robot move in exactly the same way. We're not seeing an image of a robot. We're seeing the robot, <coughs> exactly the same thing. So there's no ontological distinction between a robot that responds to real-time messages and one that responds to stored messages. Moreover, when a robot executes uh, robot puppeteer's recorded commands, 
and this is, I think, for me, the most significant thing, it retains its indexical link to that puppeteer. So when you see a puppet being controlled, a, you know, a puppeted robot or puppet, you know, part of what gives it that vitality is it's an extension of a human being. It, it is a, it's, a, it's a performance. It's a live performance. And if it's deferred, it's still a live performance. It's exactly the same performance. We see that indexical link to the puppeteer who was sending those messages, who was creating that, that control, but just after a period of time, just the, the delay. So we don't merely see a reproduction or representation of the puppeteer's performance, but a reanimation of that performance. The robot puppeteer is performing across time. The situation here is a lot like a player piano, where we've got you know, Gershwin playing on a piano roll, and then it's reanimated. We hear that piano roll again. Um, one method for creating time-delayed performance, uh, robotic performance, is to record a robot's motions while an operator manually moves the robot's parts rather than driving the robot by remote control. And this is actually the way that uh, Darwin Animator, the software that I developed, works. So the way the, prog uh, the t robots are typically uh, uh, um, manipulated, and the way that Darwin sort of out of the box is manipulated, is by entering a series of numbers that represent each of the points of the robot, and then going like keyframe animation from frame to frame. So this, then that, than that, and the robot uh, interpolates the motions to go to those different positions, and the programmer then creates a motion out of that. Uh, so instead of that, what I did is, actually there is that ability in robot animation. You can, you can create poses and go from pose to pose, and there are a few cases where that's useful, but very, very, very few. You also have real-time control, so you can move ZZAP's head in real time or have them walk around, and we certainly do that a fair amount in performance. Um, but the most uh, the central way of animating uh, is actually to turn off the servos so that they're completely limp, and then a person can move them, you know, and so then you're using your, uh, the forces of, of gravity and, and the completely variable and erratic and quirky qualities of motion with every part of your body moving at a different speed and in a different way, and then recording that. So it is puppeted. The cool thing about that, though, is you're puppeting it by actually moving it around, and then you disappear, and then it plays it back. Right. So it's doing something that a robot couldn't do. Right? It's, uh, it's not simply creating a manual puppet with unnecessary technology. Um, and in particular, the way that it works actually is, is uh, you, you can select which of the servos you want to control. So there's an image of the robot. You can click on any of the, uh, the joints, and that goes limp, and you move that one, and you can layer them. So typically, the way that we animate Zeebzob is so the arms first, and then often I start with the voice, and then that can be put into the recording, and then you add all the different elements. And you can erase the arms and then redo the arms without redoing the legs to build it that way. But the video that I'm going to show you, uh, just for the sake of, of clarity, uh, something we virtually never do for a performance, but we're animating. I have two people, one is me and one is uh, one of my students, animating seeds up all at once. So a single. So you're going to see us recording the motion, and then you'll see it played back. There we are. So moving, so programming this kind of motion would take forever. Recording it's real time. Take forever and probably not get the quality of expressivity that you can get this way. All right, so that's recorded, and then it plays back. Hi guys, good to see ya. I mean, not that I can't see you, but I wish I could. I wish I could be there as part of your institute, but uh, but I wasn't accepted. <laughs> anyway, have fun. <laughs> not a university professor, what can I say? <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, the um, Sergio had already heard about this at the time when it happened. Um, the first pr full production that we created with Zeebzob uh, which is also, I, I may talk briefly about this in terms of the pedagogy tomorrow too, because uh, it's my favorite mode of, of pedagogy, which is actually working together on an actual project. So we've got this robot, I create this tool, a little bit like Isadora, but on a much smaller scale, sort of develop the, the tool with the students to see what they need, and so it keeps evolving throughout the class. Um, and so we, we create a goal, which is to create this performance for the public at the end of the semester, so we have no computer people in this class at all, no, nobody's ever worked with a robot, We've got actors, we've got um, uh, playwrights, we've got costume designer, set designer, 
Uh, we all work together. Actually, one of my, my colleagues who specializes in committee at Alarte created the masks and helped us with some of the, the LATSI. And, and so we created from scratch this performance. We went with uh, Commedia precisely because what I was interested in with, with, with playing around with Lab was the creation of character, which is something that roboticists tend not to think about, this sort of this generic thing. So teaching Zibzab to embody as many different types of tact, to embody really different types of characters. And of course, Commedia is a very physical form with its strong gestures, which are impossible for the robot to actually really replicate given, how, but it's a good challenge. Uh, and then the masks were fun. So, and it's got these really short scenes, which practically was terrific because Zibzab uh, gets messages in real time with, through Darwin, Darwin Animator over the internet. So it can either be uh, through an uh, ethernet cable uh, and it can be plugged in or it can be wireless and it can run off a battery. But the batteries only have about 10 minutes at most battery life. So these short scenes worked really well. So Zibzab could come on, do a little shtick, then go off stage, people rapidly change the battery while something happened in front of the show. Um, worked out great. And then come back on as a completely different character with a different mask. So I'm going to show you a very short excerpt of Commedia Robotica. It's actually the whole thing. The whole, it was a half hour performance. It wasn't very long. This is a four minute you know, Reader's Digest version of it. So it starts out in the cellar theater downstairs, which you saw very, very briefly when I gave you that tour at the very beginning. Um, and you've got the programmer who, amusingly enough, was one of our dramatic media students. He actually did most of the animations and provided the voice of Zizov. So, and he's really sitting there with Darwin Animator, for the most part just hitting Q, 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 but also every, every once in a while puppeting, puppeting him. So he plays the programmer and he is the programmer. And the idea is he is this programmer who has created this Commedia robot and put out an ad for a live person to perform <coughs> with the robot. So, uh, and so this actress comes in, and of course, being a professional comedia actress, she knows all the, you know, she could come in and improvise right away as soon as she knows the scenario. She's not worried that she hasn't rehearsed. The audience is there. She comes in for the performance and finds this robot. He'd forgotten completely to mention that her partner was going to be a robot. And initially, she's sort of resistant to this idea, but warms up to it uh, until by the end of the half hour, she's fallen in love with Steve Zob, and the, fortunately, the feelings are mutual, and they were off together. Um, all right, so we'll see a little bit of this. Oh, this is Zito. <laughs> a robot? Yeah, yeah, exactly. The first robotic media del art performer. <laughs> okay, you gotta be kidding. Right, I'm not gonna do a puppet show, so. Uh, he, he's a robot. Robot, right, whatever. I'm sorry, I'm signed up for this. I'm a professional actor. I work with other professional actor, human, human actors. <laughs> I don't have help with your science patterns. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Please, don't go. Please don't go. Who said that? Okay, so you programmed the robot to do. He tried. He tried. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll get him to do about that. Oh, so you'll do it? Well, no, I didn't say that. I know. <laughs> 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 Well, I was thinking you just asked the audience to know that. She looks so sad. Oh, I'm sorry. Ha <laughs> 
<laughs> Your eyes, so stunning. And it's you. Oh. They remind me of the strength of the earth. The same ocean I destroyed 500 Cylon troopers, obliterated 20,000 Terminators, and shut down <laughs> in that start. I drew upon every ounce of strength I had in my motors, the same strength and passion that burns in your eyes. It must be for me. I, I love you so much. I, I love you too. Lord, you have to do it. I am a and so are in breaking heart. But you do it. I feel it. I am alive. She gets jealous and he unplugs her over. Sorry. Can you turn I'm sorry. it back on? I, I, no, I didn't program any of that. It's obviously malfunctioning. Maybe. Oh, so it's a malfunction to love me? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can't love. Just make it come back. I just need something else to do. Um, these total scrap metal. Uh, scrap metal. So what, you just reset it? <laughs> well, yeah. Will he remember me? Well, well no. Uh... I think we... programmer whenever Zeeb is on stage is sitting in front of the computer at that moment he's not so we had to find a way to, to cue the robot because you know Darwin animator has the, sort of the cues on it so we programmed the foot at that point so that's why she was actually doing the thing with the foot to go on to the advance to the next cue um, all right so so that's um, reanimated performance um, so um, the third mode uh, of performance is what I call algorithmic performance um, and, uh, or animatronic performance. So in this case, rather than being having that indexical link either in real time or through delayed performance, you've got, as I said, this is a very, very common way of programming the robot. It's, it's either going to, usually it's either real time robotic uh, puppet control or this you know, sequencing of events. And so, as I said, one way to do it is this Q to Q, another is in a purely algorithmic kind of style. So this is an example. This is actually Max MSP, but not using Darwin. Well, it's using a little bit of Darwin. It's, it's sending the commands directly to the robot, but bypassing the whole puppetry interface uh, and creating a straight algorithm. So what it's doing is it's simply counting from 0 to 100 and then back again. And as it does that, it's panning the head and the shoulder and these other, a certain amount of you know, number of degrees. So it's a pure algorithmic program. So I programmed this not knowing what it would look like exactly. Uh, and then hit the button and you play with it and you get something that you sort of like. Um, and so in, this is what it looks like. Totally different style of motion. Again, not better, not worse. In some ways it's very beautiful. Uh, and you could use this then to animate a live performance, right? You could have somebody that imitate the robot's motion, but it's, it's the robot's natural vocabulary. It's, it's a pure computer-generated performance. Okay. Um, so, um, let's see. So, uh, when you have uh, a purely algorithmic performance or an animated performance uh, that has no cues, that goes in sequence, then you create, and this is one of the problems with the reanimated performances as well, a huge difference between real-time puppetry and the reanimated performance. I've been emphasizing the similarities, but there is a very big difference, not in the robot itself, it doesn't know the difference, but in the robot's ability to interact with the live performer, since um, you know, the live performer is in a different time than the, the puppeteer. 
Um, and that's going to be an issue with the sort of animatronic algorithmic performances I'm talking about as well that have no sensory input, but are simply you turn them on and they do their thing. Um, the play Sayonara, which, which actually uh, Peter talked a little bit about at the beginning of the week, produced in 2010 um, uh, uh, by the uh, Sandin Theater Company and Osaka University Robot Theater Project, features the uh, Geminoid F, the hyper-realistic robot, created, as you heard, by uh, Ishiguro, one of the world's leading robotic scientists, whose obsession is to create these incredibly uncannily lifelike creatures, but he denies the existence of the uncanny valley effect altogether. Um, and when the play was initially performed in Japan, an offstage human operator controlled the Geminoid's F's movement in real time, speaking the robot's dialogue into a microphone, while cameras tracked her facial expressions and head movements. And actually, the body doesn't move at all in the performance. Uh, and this is the way that Ishiguro would actually animate most of his robots at that time. Uh, when the production toured the United States three years later, which is when I saw it, the robot's motions were then entirely canned. That performance was, the robot's performance was then encoded uh, with no internal cueing or interactivity during the 30-minute performance. The whole, it was turned on in the beginning, played to the end. Uh, and I'm going to show you a little bit of that performance. <laughs> で、ハンドルを振るのは。他の詩を読んで。はい。あれ。非常の川より川を下りしら。船引きの砂の居座ない。いつか覚えず。all right, because you feel for it. Um, so, in a talk back discussion following the performance that I saw in Philadelphia, the production's director, uh, Hirata, explained that the robot is totally controlled by myself, just like the human performers. I'm not interested <laughs> in improvisation, either for robots or humans. Uh, and Beverly Long, the live actor who performed alongside the Gemini F, I actually asked the question, so what was it like to have, because I've actually written about, you know, inveighing against canned performances of media and forcing the actor to conform to this uh, relentless media onslaught. Um, so I asked, was this a challenge? Uh, and she explained that because Harada always dictates actors' timing precisely, her process working with the robot wasn't significantly different than it had been when she worked with live actors on previous productions of the director. Um, animatronic theme parks typically use extended pre-recorded robotic sequences, but in theatrical productions with robots, the more common approach is to break the robot's motions into short segments that an operator runs as a series of cues during the performance. Um, the technique used, for example, in, in Commedia Robotica um, we had a number, you know, some of the motion as it was puppeted, mainly the robot's head so that the robot could track the live actor in real time, and the walking was all in real time too, uh, so that it wouldn't walk off the stage in part. Um, but the more complex motions were all pre-recorded, so as a combination, the cues would go from, you know, make this robotic control in, uh, to, to uh, puppet control to the animated sequence. And you could all, also combine them, they could walk while you control the head manually, for example. Um, all right, so um, let's see. So uh, a recent example, uh, I'm going to show you an example of a performance that uses uh, algorithmic control um, as opposed to the, um, the deferred, the reanimated performance. Uh, and this is a production called Uncanny Valley. There are two plays confusingly called Uncanny Valley that were written recently. One actually I directed, it's a fantastic play, but it just live people. There's a live person who plays a robot. The other uses a real robot. Uh, and this one was conceived and directed uh, by Francesca Talenti in 2014. And the production 
featured Robo Thespian, a life-size robot manufactured by Engineering Arts Limited specifically for human interaction in a public environment, like a trade show or a museum exhibit. Uh, and so uh, the robo-thespian is programmed in the way that I was talking about with the pose-to-pose to -pose actions. Uh, and in this play, Dummy, portrayed by Thobo thespian convinces Edwin, portrayed by uh, the human actor Alphonse Nicholson, to sign over his memories and emotions to the robot. And as the play progresses, the robot increasingly assimilates Nicholson's identity. Uh, Robo-thespian's proprietary software employs standard algorithmic programming methods uh, the programmer defines as a series of poses uh, and links them together using uh, the programming language, in this case, Python. Okay. Um, the production, however, complicated the issues of robotic agency uh, in a way that dovetailed effectively with the issues raised within the play itself. The robot's physical motions were created but not performed by the production's programmers. Uh, the dummy's face, however, was a video image of Nicholson projected onto the translucent white surface of uh, Robothespian's head. And the voice was also recorded by Nicholson. All right, so this is pre-recorded. The actual live actor's face was on the, the, the robot. I'm going to show you just a, a product demo of Robothespian so you can get a sense of the quality of it. It sings. I'm it acts. But it is no given the man to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous scorching. And it even impersonates other robots. I beg your pardon, General Sawyer, but that just wouldn't be proper. One of the stars of CBIT 20. So that's, that's Robot Thespian. I don't know if you can tell looking at it the difference in motion between, say, Darwin, you know, Darwin and this, you know, because it's pretty well animated. But it has a smoothness. There's a sort of roughness and awkwardness, which in, uh, I think, in a sort of vitality from the animated process that you don't get from the pose to pose process. Um, Rachel Carey, in a review of the production, observes that on paper it would be easy to dismiss Robothespian as a mere puppet. A mere puppet. Huh. After all, a great deal of his facial and vocal nuances are provided by Nicholson. But Robothespian has his own credit in the program for a reason. He's deeply engaging a unique uh, performance entity. Um, so um, I'd argue that robots programmed algorithmically are, in essence, not puppets and not really, strictly speaking, robots, but a form of automaton. Um, and from a performance standpoint, are much like the automata that, that long predate the computer age, such as uh, um, the famous um, uh, uh, trio of still functional automata by uh, Pierre Jacques Drew, the writer, the draftsman, and the musician. Uh, whose ability to write a variety of texts, draw a variety of images, and play a variety of tunes on the piano, respectively, anticipated the um, invention of the programmable computer. Uh, so this type of automata goes back, as has been documented extensively, at least to the, uh, the 16th century. And actually, there's evidence of these going way back to the classical era. Okay. Um, in the same way that programmers script a robot's movements without performing those movements themselves, the inventors who created these pre-electrical automata devised elaborate networks of gears to animate mechanical devices without themselves ever performing those actions. Kenneth Gross, in his uh, 2011 book, Puppets, an Essay on Uncanny Life, correctly insists that such automata shouldn't be confused with puppets. He says, it is indeed the absence of actual bodily life that makes the purely mechanical movements of a wind-up doll or automaton, however lifelike, feel so different from the life of puppets. The lack of the living, moving hand in the automatons, the machine's inability to respond in real time, to improvise humanly, or even humanly fall into inaction, these things place it in a different kind of theater. So I leave it to you to think about whether, or not, whether you agree with that or not. Um, the difference that Gross intuits here between puppets and automata is, I believe, real and significant, but I'd argue that Gross is conflating two distinct features of automata. First, the motions are defined algorithmically rather than being indexically linked to a real-time human performance in either the past or the present. Right? So you don't have that indexical link. Second, the motions are predetermined and invariable. You don't have the interactivity. And those are two very different things. You can have either one without the other. As we've seen when a mechanical performer plays back a human puppeteer's pre-recorded gestures, what Gross describes as the puppeteer's living, moving hand is still evident 
in the robot's motions. And conversely, it's entirely possible to create robots that respond autonomously to the world around them in real time, producing algorithmic motions with no indexical link to any human performance. And, amazingly enough, that's what we're going to look at next. Uh, so I call this mode of interaction a reactive robot. Okay, reactive performance. So I have here Zibzab reacting to sound just the way we were playing around with the Zidora. It's just taking the sound input. Zibzab has a microphone built into it. He also has a speaker, so he makes his own sounds. Uh, and this was uh, a simple program uh, so that Zibzab, it actually is using Darwin Animator, uh, but it's, it's the one time that I use the pose mode. So you can go to a pose proportionally. So it's got a pose for when it hears the noise and a pose when it doesn't. And it goes that depending on how loud the volume is. So it's actually in Max, literally you program with objects that you connect together a lot. Like Isadora, this is literally a two object program. This is taking sound input and going right into, it's actually scaling it and then going into the pose, right? And that's all there is to it. But it creates a very, very interactive or reactive dynamic kind of experience that is going to be different each and every time somebody interacts with it. So here it is. And I actually built in a little bit of a delay to make it. So artists have been creating performative works with autonomous robots for decades. Typically, however, this work is uh, developed not for theater venues, but for gallery or museum settings where robots interact with the audience and where you can actually experience that kind of interactivity by playing with it yourself. Uh, so first, it's relatively simple to simulate autonomous robotic behavior in a rehearsed performance with actors. And conversely, it's much easier for spectators to assess whether a robot's responses um, are truly reactive when they interact with it themselves. And second, while robotic puppetry is given the simplest uh, current state of technology, the simplest and most effective way to give theatrical robots the ability to interact with live actors, real-time puppetry is less practical in an installation context, right? So you can't really have puppeted performance in a, in a museum 24 hours a day. So, so the museum context, the gallery context, is driven this kind of either automata or reactive performance. One of the earliest and most influential re reactive performances, if you did the reading from Chris Salter, uh, it, it, you'll see it was uh, Edward uh, Inatsovitz's The Senster, commissioned in 1970 by Philips Electronics uh, for the Avalon Science uh, Museum in the Netherlands. So this 15-foot-long hydraulic robot had an abstracted animal-like form with three legs, a long neck, loosely evocative of a giant insect or a dinosaur. The creature, controlled by a mainframe computer, used a Doppler radar to track visitors' movements and recoiled from sudden movements and sounds. Okay. Another example, uh, in 1993, Sam and Penny created a similarly reactive piece, Matit Mal, with the goal of producing a robotic, this is his words, a robotic artwork which is truly autonomous uh, and that gives the impression of intelligence and has behavior which is neither anthropomorphic nor zoomorphic but which is unique in its physical and electronic nature. So this was the robot, approximately three feet tall, consisting of little more than a vertical rod top with sensors and flanked by two bicycle wheels. It sensed when somebody was nearby and rolled toward that person, continuously turning and moving in an effort to maintain a forward-facing position two feet away from the spectator. So super simple algorithm, but like the sound with Zibzab, depending on how you move, you can create an infinite number of different types of behaviors and responses giving that sense of reactivity and, and cognizance to it in a purely you know, independent kind of way. And actually, he appeared with, with my first robotic, in, uh, actually not uh, interactive installation, Flico. They were actually, in 1993, they were in the same exhibit. Um, the exhibit that, uh, to the extent to which such robots are purely reactive, their, perform their behavior is predictable, and most significantly, under the control of the human that interacts with it. So in the case of Zibzab, in the case of Petit Mal, they actually don't have any uh, ability to modify the algorithm. And so you can then figure out, I move like this, it's going to do this, I move. You can actually choreograph it, uh, dance with it. Um, so um, 
I can quickly figure out as an audience member that I am actually in control of the robot's movements, and so I'm apt to ab ab uh, adopt a perspective outside the fictional frame, at least temporarily, to experiment with my ability to move the, the manipulator. And you see this all the time. Uh, so you break the rules of the game, and you start playing with the robot. Uh, even after I become aware that the robot has no real autonomy, however, I still retain the ability to shift my perspective, or shift the frame back, uh, and respond to the robotic character as an autonomous being with its own personality and emotions. Right. So you have a two-way performance, the human performer who knows full well it's not sentient, but can perform with it as sentient, as responsive. The simplest way to endow an inherently reactive system with the illusion of autonomy is to program in some random behaviors. For example, Petit Mal could randomly change the distance. So instead of always being two feet, it could just randomly shift between two and five. And in some cases, it might want to be 100 feet. So then you think, why does it hate me? And it seems to like that person. It's just totally <laughs> randomly. To create richer and less arbitrary behaviors, one can create robots with multiple, sometimes conflicting inputs, or create a feedback system by putting multiple responsive robots together and having them react to each other. And this brings us to our next example. Bill Vorn and uh, Louis-Philippe uh, Demers implemented precisely these strategies back in the 1990s in a series of robotic installations that, again, Salter talks about. Though he, I don't believe he talks about this one, which is the one that I saw. Um, these robots are completely non-anthropomorphic. Uh, they describe the work as a form of theater where robots are the actors. So it's normal that we want to project emotions onto them. So one of their first collaborations was a robotic sculpture called Espace Victoral, which consisted of eight tall motorized tubes, approximately four feet tall, each containing a speaker and a light source. Ultrasonic sensors tracked spectators as they moved around the circumference of the installation, um, and each tube responded independently to the spectators by rotating and producing sound. Though they didn't communicate directly with one another, they were each completely separate, the tubes seem to be working together to create structured patterns and behavior until at a particular point one tube would break away from the flock and point directly to an individual spectator. So I'll show you just a little bit of this performance. From 1993. <laughs> system of this sort can exhibit seemingly complex behaviors that produce a powerful illusion of sentience, emotion, and personality, even if it's completely non-anthropomorphic. Such systems are, are unable to pursue and modify long-term goals, develop strategies, or learn and adapt to behaviors over time. Artificial intelligence researchers distinguish between reactive systems like these and deliberative systems, a distinction that parallels the one made by neuroscientists between automatic, reactive, and willed, deliberative behaviors. Uh, while some AI researchers focus on one or the other of these two approaches, increasingly the trend is to develop hybrid, reactive, deliberative systems. Um, to date, there have been few efforts to incorporate a high level of deliberative AI into robotic performance. But as the technology matures and becomes more accessible, that's likely to change. Again, I leave totally open the question from an artistic or ethical or whatever standpoint, whether it should. I mean, there's no, you know, um, so that's something for us to think about. Now close to 15 years old, one of the few effective examples, actually I'm going to show you um, just here's uh, a behavior. This is not, at least ostensibly, an art behavior. This is the Darwin OPZ uh, robot, not Zibza, but another one, uh, which has been programmed to kick a ball, right? So it's completely reactive, but it has a, a goal. It's got an objective. It wants to kick the ball. So, here, I made an interesting demonstration and the target will score this ball. So it's using the camera and it says... It's detected, so it won't score this ball, and then it will 
stop. And it will grab the ball and then throw it away. Right, throws it. Uh, and that reaction is significant. There's something about, well, Zeebzab himself is cleverly designed to evoke the sort of cute response, which is adorable. But also, seeing that deliberative behavior, it's like seeing a baby doing it. It's like, well, this is doing something, or a, a pet is doing it, a cat. Um, but of course, Zeebzab is doing absolutely nothing at all. It's a really simple algorithm that's simply programmed to uh, do what it's been programmed to do. So anyway, now close to 15 years old, one of the few effective examples of an autonomous robotic performance um, that employs this hybrid reactive deliberative approach uh, remains a piece called Public Anemone, ba way back in 2002. It was a robotic installation at SIGGRAPH, the big computer graphics tech conference, created by Cynthia Brazil, uh, who is uh, one of the long-term innovators in the field of social robotics. She actually literally wrote the book, Social Robotics. Uh, it came out of her PhD dissertation back in, I think it was uh, 99 or something. It's been, it's been quite a while. Brazil is a fond, um, so uh, Brazil has created a series of robots um, called Kismet and Leonardo that are designed specifically to simulate human behavior. So that's her whole focus is to create a kind of emotional intelligence in these robots. Um, Public Anemone is a much more abstract piece um, that it's an interactive terrarium filled with imaginary biomorphic creatures that she refers to as anemones. The installation includes a computer vision, this is way back 2002, a computer vision system capable of isolating and analyzing multiple features on uh, multiple individuals in real time and conveying that information to these little creatures. And each anemone is programmed to carry out specific tasks, such as bathing in a waterfall or watering plants. So the idea is that it's engaging in its behaviors on its own. And then as you get closer, uh, an anemone might become distracted from its uh, task and approach with interest. If a spectator makes a threatening gesture, the anemone might retreat fearfully before gradually regaining its composure and either returning to its task or tentatively reaching out to another spectator. Um, Brazil undertook this project because she regards theater as the perfect test bed for social robotic research. To quote, good actors often say that half of acting is reacting. Hence, a robotic actor must be able to act, react in a convincing and compelling manner to the performance of another entity, whether human or robot. This requires sophisticated perceptual, behavioral, and expressive capabilities. Introducing improvisation or allowing for more audience participation makes the situation that much more unpredictable and unconstrained. Approaching open-ended interaction with people. Advances within such a test scenario could help bootstrap the social interactivity of robots in the real world. So in performances with human actors, the sort of performances with which audiences are most familiar, the performer and the embodied character are both typically housed in the same body. Uh, that is a live actor. In the case of puppets, however, whether robotically or manually controlled, the performer and the embodied character are company. Right? Simple enough. The puppeteer per performs through the robot. So the performer is me, the uh, character is embodied character is this other thing. Uh, by contrast, um, in the case of algorithmically performed robots, the programmer animator does not perform through the robot in that way. Right? but creates the robot's performance. So, so I create the performance, but I've never performed it. In the case of autonomous robots, the programmers, which at this point I still think, would say is a hypothetical thing, the programmers and engineers neither perform through the robot, nor do they actually create the robot's performance, but rather they create a robotic performer. So we've come full circle. Like a live actor, the performer and the embodied actor once again become one and the same, so now, they're both situated in the body of the robot rather than the human performer. So robot performers destabilize the notion of performance and in particular the agency of the performer. The robot's agency uh, is distributed in complex, ambiguous, and often even within a given performance, fluid ways among its robotic designers, programmers, and operators, 
even as it begins to acquire, without at this stage in the technology, self-awareness, or indeed any degree of sentience, its own autonomous agency. Moreover, within the context of a theatrical performance, its behaviors and choices are also defined and circumscribed by the agency of a playwright and or a director. The questions who is acting and who is pulling the strings become terribly fraught. However, as we examine these dynamic closely, we see that they're different in degree, but uh, not really in kind from those of more conventional performance with human performers. As those involved in the making of performance, uh, in performances in theater and film are well aware, the construction of an actor's performance is always a deeply collaborative process with multiple forces animating and ornamenting the, perform the body of the performer. So I'll end by returning to the figure of Pygmalion that I started with, this time as envisioned uh, in Al Hirschfeld's famous, uh, Hirschfeld's famous illustration for the original Broadway production of My Fair Lady, which is in my office. Uh, it depicts the image of Henry Higgins pulling Eliza Doolittle, Eliza Doolittle strings as if she were a marionette, while in turn George Bernard Shaw, figured as God, pulls on Higgins strings. This image vividly reminds us that the complex layers of agency in puppetry, and even more so in robotics, are, al are, are already implicit in the dynamics of all theater and performance. All right, thank you very much. So we have some time for your thoughts and comments. Yeah. Uh, Sheldon. This is sort of an anecdote, and maybe this is a question. Um, in the news lately, uh, in the Bay Area, in Ber I've seen them in Berkeley, and now in San Francisco, there's uh, delivery robotic drones that just sort of wheel down the sidewalk and deliver food yeah. to people. And, um, so the news hasn't been about you know how great that is. It's mostly been about how people have taken to kicking them, uh, urinating on them. Uh, in one case, setting one on fire. Uh, and so, you know, as these things become real and start to really actually become a part of our lives, there's obviously tensions about this. Absolutely, we have real feelings about this. And so I'm just curious, you know, as you put these things on stage what your experience has been with audiences trying to negotiate these tensions between, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a fantastic point. Um, and it's really interesting to try to think through those different reactions. What I found, the responses I mentioned before to Zizov tends to be, you know, that uh, people fall in love with Zizov. Zizov is very cute. Uh, I wish I had that sort of, that charisma that Zizov seems to naturally have. Um, <laughs> within the safe environment of the theater. Uh, but, you know, there was another uh, uh, sort of installation event that uh, I can't remember who created it that I read about of this robot that was supposed to make this long trek across the country and did not make it very far. Do you, are anybody familiar with that? It was, it was, it was uh, people kept abusing the poor robot and strike. He was supposed to ask for help and uh, it was ultimately did not make it far. Uh, how much of that has to do with I mean, in a museum or an installation, people always try to break the thing to test it and to see how it works. Um, but I think within a communal setting of the theater, I think people's responses would be very different than in the sort of one, if you see it wandering through the street. But I, it's a really fascinating question. With those, it's a question of affect. It gets back to that, what, when it triggers that response. Yeah. really fascinating to think about the ways that the robot as puppet is connected to the actor's role in the theatre, but one of the big differences is that humans have subjectivity outside of that context. You know, right. like, like, so it's sort of, again, it comes back to that sense of the frame, that inside of that frame there are rule-based interactions that, that can sort of create autonomy. And um, I mean, one of the questions that sort of this is more like about the whole areas, the whole kind of range of things that we've been talking about and studying is, I think a lot of these moves are sort of moving towards a universal language of total translatability, mm. you know, in, in the sense of the way that the computer programs we've been looking at work and, um, you know, so that one, th so that a sound can drive a machine or a light can trigger, you know, that 
yeah. this kind of the language of zeros and ones can turn a thing into another thing almost completely. Right. You know, and absolutely. I think that's maybe part of what people are struggling with with robots is the sort of breakdown of ontology. You know, and I wonder for us as we're thinking about the digital humanities and things that we make and things that we do. Um, also about the translatability of one face onto another or one voice onto right. another and whether this kind of border panic that we're experiencing in so many ways in our world is also to do with this kind of breakdown of these ontological distinctions between types of things, types right. of beings and types of processes. Right. I think so you're, that's you're, a sort yeah. of really big thought or question, but I, you know, without really a focus, but I, right. I feel like there's a sort of underlying common theme in so many of the things that are going on in different parts of our world to do with this ontological breakdown that is also a source of such incredible power that one thing can translate into another. You know, like the fact that your project was called Rosetta seems right, very right. significant to absolutely. me in, in all these directions. Yeah, absolutely. And specifically in the case of, of robots and the, and the issues I'm looking at, you're dealing with, goes right back to the initial, you know, Maury's theory of the uncanny that border between life and not life, and the terror of seeing that. And precisely by complicating that, it's a very, very, very threatening thing. And as you were talking, you know, suddenly struck me, you're talking about the use of this in digital humanities. Humanities, it's built right in there, digital humanities, right? Um, and, you know, I think the threat of the drones walking, you know, delivering uh, groceries or whatever, you know, part of that is an economic threat, are these robots. And every time people, from the very beginning, when people talk about robots in a theater, Oh, they're going to take away jobs from actors? I mean, it's, that's the joke that everybody always likes to make first. Th there is this threat. Are we losing something about our own humanity by challenging it in that way? Or by, you know. So it might be that the straightforward robotic puppets don't threaten you in that way because still, they're still tethered to a human, or at least even if it's deferred. Um, but the autonomous robots out in the street delivering <laughs> groceries are going to be, I think, a lot scarier and more threatening. And it might be in, you know, those the robotic installation, you know, that is purely reactive and completely non anthropomorphic. It's the reaction to that is not how cute. And the music actually that was created for that was not adorable music. It was creepy, threatening, mm -hmm. you know, fascinating, enthralling. But it questions you, are these alive? Are they not alive? What does it mean? It's, it is responding, but they're not sentient, but how do I really know and what does that even mean? You know. I was just thinking about this alongside um, sort of the newest generation of Disney's animatronic figures, which use sort of the traditional animatronic frame, but they're now going to all electric to get to make them smoother in terms right. of their movement. But within the face, they've gone to a completely projected mapping technology. So what they're doing is making, in essence, not that they ever wanted those animatronics to look particularly human, but they're now able to make those animatronic figures look like almost literal 3D um, versions of the animated films, mm -hmm. some some of which are three D. So I I kind of wonder how that project, which is admittedly a hugely sort of commercial one in which you want little kids to be able to see the thing in right. front of you, right? Um, how that sort of interacts within this sort of I don't know the spectrum, the, the the sort of the range of of the examples that you were giving here, or in light of yeah. this sort of these are ones that we're supposed to love as opposed to want to kick. Right. Well, the decisive issue in terms of what I was talking about um, has to do with the degree of interactivity or autonomy. So, insofar as you turn it on and it does its thing, whether the face is projected or you know, it doesn't make a difference there, sure. it certainly can make a huge difference in your affect, in your, resp your affective response to it, for sure. Um, but, um, you know, I've seen in the Harry Potter world, in the, the bank, there, this, um, the animatronic figures there are incredible. And their facial react expressions are are just wonderful. They're beautiful. They're amazing. They've gotten really advanced, but they're a hundred percent canned. Right. And you know, I think that our response to those, and they're just like, how fun! This is really cool. But I think when they actually can look right at you and respond to you, people are going to start feeling. We'll see. But my prediction would be, people. I would feel more threatened and well, freaked they, out. And they did have for a little while what was called the living character initiative, which were more about sort of these kinds of animatronic characters that would roam the park and have direct interaction. Right. Um, and also using their Bluetooth technology to be able to like know the kids' names. This was sort of a right. thing too, which was also kind of 
freaky if suddenly this character knows your child um, <laughs> and what that means um, in terms of stranger danger and those kinds of things. Um, so I think that you're exactly right that I think that, the, that they've even sort of had to sort of go back to the drawing board in terms of that, the interactivity and how much interactivity may be too much with the sort of the more realistic versions right. of these characters. And some of it actually in the, um, when, I, when I directed Uncanny Valley, which my, uh, the other Gibbons Uncanny Valley, which doesn't have a robot in it, I did let Zeeb Zob, because he was really giving me a hard time about doing a, a robot show without him, do the curtain <laughs> speech. Uh, but at the beginning, as the audience came in, he was just standing there like a prop and sort of, you know, looking around like that. And everyone started to zoom in on a person as the eye color would change and track that person around. <laughs> Because he was being controlled remotely, and the camera was transmitting back to the computer backstage, so the person could see it. But that was a freaky moment because it was, it's, it's a changing frame moment where you think you're just seeing this prop, and then suddenly it seems sentient, uh, and it responds to you. That was a, that was kind of fun. And then it did its cam speech. Yeah, I just yeah. want to add that I'm always fascinated by um, we like want to make ourselves, we want to build ourselves, but then when we get too close, we kind of want to stop. Yeah. Like, wait a minute, <laughs> right? So there's just this weird, because I, I was thinking this yesterday, as I always do in workshops, like, why is it so exciting when we can go like this <laughs> and make magic happen over there? You know, there's this like extension yes. of our will, which is kind of magic. So we like want to create magic and we want to, it's that. I mean, it is that we want to be the guy at the top right there, <laughs> making the next one, making the next one. But when right. we achieve it, we kind of go, whoa, oh, hang on. Maybe I don't want that. Because in the case that Sheldon just brought up, that did take a job. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Somebody lost their job because they don't need the delivery boy anymore. You know? yeah. I don't know. I don't have a question. It's just yeah. a phenomenon that's, that's, yeah. And then there's sex robots. I mean, oh, yeah. The implications of that are so mm -hmm. enormous in right. terms of instrumentalization. Yes. Yeah, I was thinking of when you were talking about agency in particular, right? The um, that might be uh, in 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 terms of sex robots. Actually, like this is now like the sort of opened up frontier, right? So it was, I think it was just at the CES they introduced a sex robot that um, detects overly aggressive behavior mm. or. Um, uh, if the robot feels like it's being treated inappropriately, will shut down <laughs> and become unresponsive. Um, and this was apparently programmed, I can't remember the name of the, the roboticist who did it, but into the objections of his wife. Right. And so um, now, now. Wait, what did you say? The, the wife objected the wife to his programming that? Yes. The, 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 no, no. His wife like oh. objected to the sort of uh, lack of really consent yeah. Yeah. that right. that sex robots were engendering yeah. and facilitating. Yeah. Um, and so he introduced a new feature. I think it's Samantha. Is that the Samantha sex robot? Yeah. I might be misremembering this. Yeah. yeah. I, was, I was just reading about this. I'm pulling the article back up. I was just reading about this the other day. Um, what's creepy about that feature is that it 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 stops the interactivity of the robot, but in no way prevents continued. No, that's right. Still, so, I mean, you can still yeah. just. It just it actually doesn't it it actually. I mean, it, it, I guess in that it it just transforms an encounter from one that is consensual into non-consensual. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And it's considering that the consumer is the person who's going to be interacting with the robot, then um, unless it was legally mandated or something, um, that certainly wouldn't be a feature. <laughs> that but brings in the whole ethics of, when you get into that, of artificial intelligence, the ethics, that, that whole argument that now we have to start talking about. Because at the end of the day, it's, it's wires and binary. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, that robot doesn't can control robot. anything. Right. Exactly. It had some sensing programmed into exactly. it. Exactly. Right, so the ethics there don't really have to do, obviously, with the robot. We're not no, concerned about the robot. Right. We're concerned about what the person's client. being trained to do. So it gets into the same debates with video games and violence. Exactly. Although there is also then a, and a further edge when we start talking about um, bio art. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, and so if you look at um, Oren and, and um, uh, oh gosh, what is it? Oren Katz and... Uh, is the other of um, ours, 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 um, right, come back to me. <laughs> <laughs> I have Googling, I must and do it. Uh, Eduardo Cox, Cox, and the, uh, I, not at this point, who did the rabbit? That was Eduardo Cox. Yeah. But, um, uh, uh, no, I'm thinking of um, 
Symbiotica. Um, uh, so Orin Katz and um, I can't remember uh, his collaborator, uh, which I really should remember. Um, anyway, the, um, so um, uh, Symbiotica uh, in Australia had um, developed a project, that I think they called it like the Living Jacket. Living, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Basically, they, they started doing experiments with um, so called victimless meat, right? Synthetically mm -hmm. created mm -hmm. um, organic flesh. And, uh, and they built a little tiny, uh, quote unquote, living leather jacket, um, which was constructed out of, of this, this synthetic meat. And so it lives in this kind of bathed solution, and it is organic material, and it is, and it is growing, right? It is cells reproducing. Um, and and they and they installed it. I believe it was at MoMA, and it like lived in a little tank. And it it gets a little weird because it's growing, and you know, and it's and then and then they left. Um, Ionit Zor, I think, is the, is his partner. Um, and and uh, anyway, they left it. And then at the end of the exhibition, the the curator, you know, calls them up and is like, "So what do I do?" With it? And they're like, "Well, you got to turn it off," <laughs> and which essentially means killing it. Right, so you've got a, an artificially created mm. mm -hmm. biological system that is consuming, that is re reproducing, that is growing, right? That is an organic, quote unquote, <clears throat> living entity, artificially supported. Um, you know, kind of really interesting intersection of, of bio art and, and robotic art. Um, that that in order to deinstall the installation, you know, like you've got to basically pull the plug on something that. You know that's alive, and that's not alive in the way a plant is alive, right? There's like you know it's 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 alive in the way that flesh is alive, right? So you turn up anyway. So it raised some of the same kind of questions and freaked out the curator quite a bit. Yeah. Well, I had not anticipated that particular moment. I mean, one question I could throw out that's interesting, um, just in terms of the threat that people have of robotics um, and the threat of it re replacing humans. Why haven't unless they haven't? I've never heard of it. People have the same response to animation. It's exactly the same thing. You've got a completely synthetic being that people relate to effect, emotionally, effectively. It replaces, you, but there's never that. Oh, it's going to replace people. Or animations are evil, right? Uh, I just throw it out. I'm not, what is it about robots that they can't manipulate the world in the same way that I? It's kind of work. Right. I'm talking about even in a, in a performance context. But yeah, certainly. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Do you say context? Yeah. Right. Right. I was right. Gonna, David, I think, I think part of that, I mean, I've just had in my mind sort of this modernist paradigm that in some ways kind of emerges around the same time as the first kind of thinking about, um, about robotics. It's Chapek. I mean, it's thinking about the thinking uh, through he Hegel's notion of recognition. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to think of all the times I've seen people interacting with robots. They're always... They're always right there in its face. They want to be recognized by that robot. They want that robot to acknowledge their presence in some way or another. Mm -hmm. And that feels very much to me like that master-slave dialectic, right, that um, uh, particularly when we get into the 20th century into kind of radical avant-garde readings of, of that, um, of that master-slave dialectic. It's all about recognition. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, this is what um, Franz Fanon uh, focused on. So it, I think it's something about not being recognized by a robot that's coming. And part of the antagonism I've understood, from what I've heard to these robots is, yes, it's an economic or class anxiety. But the other thing is that, what the fuck are you doing in our streets? You don't exactly. acknowledge we're here, except I'll just wait for you to get out of my way. Yeah. right? And it feels in line with a broader sense of certain kinds of people. The Google buses. Not yet, yeah, not being recognized. Exactly. Like you, exactly. you're not really here, and we're talking San Francisco, right? And, and probably among the cities where people are most well, well, this conscious. Is, this, is, this would be rolling right down Market Street. Yeah, yeah. Which is, right. So you don't get recognized in a city where you're not getting recognized, where so many people don't get recognized. I wonder how people would respond to it if instead of this thing that's rolling down the street and not acknowledging you, it was actually this. Creature that was like walking in this forlorn, sympathetic <laughs> way, as it was exhausted, and then, and then, if when it sees people, it sort of moves very, you know, uh, solicitously out of the way. And if you if you 
start to attack him, <laughs> whatever. And the people, I suspect people would come to its defense. Others would probably completely, you know, attack it and destroy Clearly it and bring up the shape malice. The shape, the size, and the whatever would, would shift things to some degree. In this case, they're not terribly robot-like in any sort of humanoid sense. They're just right. a rolling box, really. We're, right. But they do have defense mechanisms. <laughs> so if you tamper with it, very loud piercing sirens go off. They have cameras all the way around so that they can see, you know, if they if somebody needs to check in. Well, that would make me want to attack it, too. I know. <laughs> <laughs> have, you, have you seen the videos of the programmer slapping the robot? Of, of hitting oh, yeah. it, and it. Have you seen have any? It's seen lost that? in dynamics. Yes, and they're yeah. slapping this thing in the face over and over and over again. And it's that master, it's, it's just once again reinforcing. It's like that's going to come back in 100 years, and it's going to. Yeah, uh, that's, that's called yeah. the revolution. Every good piece of sci fi out there, yeah. which is, I mean, sci fi is at, at its essence, it turns into a morality tale. Exactly. Every good piece of sci fi that talks about robots or artificial life or the singularity. <laughs> um, <laughs> basically comes back to this is what happens when you try to play God. And that's essentially what Pygmalion is about as well. Absolutely. This is what happens when you yeah. try to play God. Your creature takes on a life of its own and it comes back and bites you. Mm -hmm. And so I think that this, so to riff off of your idea of sort of Pygmalion recognition, this might be the counter side of that coin in that there's also a fear of being recognized. Mm -hmm. So maybe a complication of this. So I've got in my mind in particular uh, Westworld. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's in that sense, what you have, and it almost parallels this exactly, that you have, if you're familiar with the, with the, the, the series, uh, one of the core, two, actually two of the central uh, characters are both uh, women who are robots, um, both of whom are uh, being manipulated in some way by a human being in the narrative, all of whom are being manipulated by this kind of chief coder who play, who's li almost literally God in the show. And so I only raise that is that the other aspect of this would be we begin to feel as we encounter robots that regardless of what dynamic there might be between the two, there's something bigger out there that is exerting agency, the program, whether it, you know, the, you know, whether we have free will or it's determined. So there's there's always three in the picture, right? Um, there's actually something kind of, uh, it's spinning a little bit back to video games, but there's something a bit revelatory about what it means to be the puppeteer. Um, in a robotic context or a video game context, I don't know how many of you have read the article out there about The Sims and how basically everyone who plays The Sims begins behaving like a sociopath eventually yeah. and torturing their Sims to oh, death yeah. and haunting them and, and yeah. torturing them with clowns and whatever. Um, and it, it also reveals something kind of deeply rooted within human nature that this is our desire. Once we have the ability to play God, black and white is another video game example where when you have the chance to play God, we tend to choose the evil path, which is kind of interesting. GTA, Grand Theft Auto, you have run over people and beat people with baseball bats. Mm -hmm. I guess. It also traces back, I mean, for me, I, I'm thinking of like the, fr the Frankenstein, the novel, right? Like mm -hmm. this concept so that it's, you know, the body as this thing, this apparatus that can be built. And so it is definitely this playing God, because that's going back to uh, Paradise Lost, but it's this, this anxiety mm -hmm. about free will, about control, and about responsibility to others, and to this kind of like weirdly like a return of the repressed kind of thing, I think. Might because that whole, you know, in 100 years, the robot wars are coming. And, you know. Can I ask a question, though? Oh, so, a couple years ago, my stepson and I had this conversation. He said the jobs of the future are going to be robot designer or, and or robot technician, and that'll be all there is. <laughs> Everybody else, we're gonna have to have some kind of universal salary for the rest of the world. Yes. There's gonna be nothing for us to do. And I was imagining like Robbie the robot. I was like, oh, it's gonna take a long time for humans to get used to those you know, things coming down Market Street, and like, I don't think that's that close. And like, and he and he just picked up his phone and he was like, Siri, where's the nearest Walmart? And <laughs> Siri said, Sebastian, the nearest Walmart is 1.5. And then so I, my question is, where does a robot begin? Does it have to be a metal right. object yeah. that looks like a thing, yeah. even a non-humanoid yeah. thing? Because I, I, after he and I had that conversation, I saw robots all around me. Absolutely. I could not see them everywhere I went. And so I think it's like, 
uh, we're just getting used to, we're get, it's like sub, it's slowly seeping into our acceptance. And the closer it looks like to a human, the weirder it is, but it's all around us anyway. Just a, what a comment about that the, the, um, is that gets to um, another robot trope, which is different from the one that you're talking about, the, that goes back to RUR, the, the robots are going to turn against you, is the Wally trope, which comes yeah. to the end. You know, where we, where the robots and that we become completely dependent on them because of their <coughs> benevolence. <Yeah. laughs> and there's also the, the like the big hero six uh, trope as well, where you have this ghost of the memory of someone else within that that circuitry as well, uh, that is is lovable. Um, and it, I mean, the fear of robots. I think we like to pretend that it's a, a natural thing, uh, but it's still a, a culture, you know, thing that we've been building as well. Also yeah. with both Wally -E and Big Hero Six, they talk about something completely different about human nature because they're they're both beautiful films that address the very human issue of loneliness. Yes. Mm -hmm. And a desire in some ways to be more human. I don't know, or so that there's sympathy in the fact that that robot can't be fully human. Sort of like going back to Boon Raku, which is what I think about too. Right. Yeah. David, can you so I, so this really, I, I find this, this whole narrative r very compelling, and particularly the sort of seeming split between the cute robot and the threatening robot. Um, uh, because again, like robot actually came, came, you know, in that first play from, from worker, right. right? And so it's actually, I think a lot of this anxiety is, like part of it's the economic anxiety of, of being replaced. But it's also the economic anxiety of the power differentials that, right. right, in which one recognizes that one's own social position is is reliant on compulsory, uh, on compelled right. and subservient labor, yeah. right? And so, like the robots have always been slaves, and so we replay colonial and slave and imperial narratives yeah. out on them, both in the trope of like the big hero six who is the lovable servant. Mm -hmm. Right, who stands by us even under torture and despite the fact of being right. I mean, and then and then the nefarious, right, um, uh, you know, version which is going to come up against us. But but I'm wondering, you know, if we're sort if we're thinking about robots in terms of power and particularly in terms of, perf of performance and, and their sort of history in that, um, when you're like when you see students working with these and when you're incorporating this into a kind of shared project, how do you structure the conversations around the kind of conceptual and relational approach to the robot, right? Like, do you, do you kind of let students kind of feel out the robot wherever they are? Like, how do you attend to gender pronouns with mm -hmm. the robots? Is, is Ibsov always male? Um, are there, you know, uh, do, you know, are there certain kinds of dynamics? Like we, we get in the Commedia, you know, the kind of love story, right. you know, do you, do you talk, you know, how do you, how do you work through some of the, the, the power narratives that are like, that replay in particular ways through robots? Yeah, no, that's a really, really, really good point. Uh, and Zibzab isn't always male at all. You might've noticed actually in the demo when I made that for this, Zibzab had the lips that somebody had added for one of the students for, uh, a performance. Um, so, um, that's a really, really good point. Um, I, it plays out exactly the same way that the, any question I think of puppetry plays out insofar as ultimately who's responsible for the, for the Ubisoft performance and the choices that you're making. Um, it's the puppeteer, it's the creator, and sort of owning that and taking responsibility for that. Um, so it's exactly the same way you would with any other performance that you were creating, really. But it raises those issues because you're, yeah. I think there's a complication here because the question that was, in my mind, um, Sarah was, and it relates to something you said earlier, David, about the robot is having a kind of distributed agency. And yeah. So my question has been, where is the robot? Right. So yeah, we can be right. responsible for um, what we do with the puppet, but because puppets are programs, and when we, when we right. look at sort of mass marketed puppets, or we're looking at something like Siri, for example, as robot, there are m mechanics and procedures 
that aren't necessarily evident to us and, and that we may have a robot in front of us that is that we're responsible for, that we're controlling and playing with and allowing to grow and develop in some ways, but that programming is, is also somewhere else that we, we can't really be responsible for. Right. Um, and that can be for a number of reasons. Like, you know, the, the image that comes to my mind is Joy in, in Blade Runner 2049. Where Joy is this beautiful individual for for Kay, and she gets killed, and he's in mourning, and then shortly after, he's walking down the street and runs into giant ballerina joy. Right, uh, right. So that that idea of responsibility is really important, but responsibility implies the capacity for mutual recognition, one, and also the ability to really locate where that responsibility is. Right. And with the robot, it's, and I think part of your, your talk showed that, the, yeah. it's not really all there, and it right. may be completely somewhere else. Right. Is, I hope that makes sense. It makes total sense. Sincerity, I, I hope you understand how. Mm -hmm. I think this question is a really interesting one, but it has very much to do with where do we locate agency and responsibility in, in the ethical moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm wondering just if to follow up with Sarah. So, so how is because these how are these issues for you different <coughs> when you're dealing with students programming a robot as opposed to students directing? Actors in a, in a acting class with other actors because they're the same choices, that the same issues that come up, they're the same presumptions. If anything, they can be even stronger because you've got gendered actors that people make assumptions about. So you're then imposing on these bodies, these actual bodies, these assumptions rather than this piece of metal that you can transform more easily. Well, I mean, I, I, it seems to me that there's a, there is a real parallel there. I think the 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 biggest difference is that um, you know, obviously, when when you're working with actors or when you're working with student directors working with student actors, for right. example, like the student actors can say what they think, right. and part of the part of the exercise, uh, for me at least, in in training student theater makers. It really in, in like the art of collaboration is how to listen properly. Right, and how to give a space for people to say what they've been. Yeah. Right, right, and, 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 how to, and how to listen to things that are going unsaid and how to, you know, yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I think making space is a, is a great kind of overarching metaphor for what that process is. The robot only says what the robot's been taught right. how to say, and what the robot has been taught how to say is a direct reflection of who has been interacting with the robot. Right. So in many ways, and, and part of what this whole discussion and what Mike is talking about, right, it's like, it's like robots are, are essentially these kinds of mirrors right. that take what are our fears and fantasies and mm -hmm. ideas and, and, um, and, and projections and kind of play them back to us right. in a way that depending on how it's calibrated, may be incredibly reassuring of our social choices and our position in society, might be incredibly threatening based on what kinds of choices that, right? So I guess my, my question is that when you're working with students, because robots have this potential to be a seemingly objective and neutral space, that then people, I, I think the temptation is always to read those reflections as natural. Right. Um, and this is coming up in a, in a slightly different kind of row um, emphasis on bot environment, right? Which is where we talk about algorithms, right? That are not written as neutral entities, right? That are reflecting, making certain kinds of assumptions about the world and are reflecting certain kinds of patterns back to us, but appear to be objective and accurate and, and like what the world is, right? And then in, in fact are reshaping our perception. Right? There's this kind of feedback loop, which I think theater is particularly well suited to assess mm -hmm. and to and to freeze in space in order to look at it at better, but I guess I guess my my question and, and, and I, I don't work with robots in performance, or I haven't in a, in a in a long time and it was never sort of my major. But I'm just I, it, it brings to mind like I, it seems that there are interesting questions, but also some real problems or potential problems in think in helping students think through what are the implications like. You know, how do you see the? How do you interact with Zipsob, and what are the assumptions that you make? Then, what are the assumptions that I make? Yeah. Then, when you talk to it as a him, what is that? What do I understand about about my relationship to this object? Mm -hmm. And if we construct certain kinds of, you know, romantic narratives, mm -hmm. right? Presumably heterosexual romantic narratives around, you know, an 18-inch piece of, mm -hmm. you know, machinery. How does that affect how we understand 
our place in this and what our and, and what our position you know what I mean like yeah, and so absolutely. it's and it's and, and so I was just you know I mean you, uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot like I, I, you are obviously in a, an incredibly thoughtful and I know you work through this stuff in really you know careful ways with your students so I've just that's why I was that's what yeah, I was sort of no, getting I mean, at one thing that right. ma- you're talking is making me think about in a really interesting way um, is the sex doll issue we were talking about before because you know, if you're working with live performers, unfortunately, within a common conception of the director, you don't engage as collaboratively. You might. You, you, it's too much like the My Fair Lady Pygmalion thing. Um, but there is the agency. There is a collaboration. There is. It's you know, the, the actor is working with you, talking back. You don't have that with a robot. So there is that danger of then you're imposing completely your own fetishes and your own. I mean, there, yeah. So I think that's something definitely to be incredibly conscious about. And to, you know, I think what you need is that perspective. The other students mm-hmm. in the room <laughs> are utterly crucial to that. Um, yeah, I, I've been thinking a lot about this. And, and one of the uh, things that I find interesting to continue the, the, the student actor metaphor, and to be fair, this is very incomplete, but the idea that the students have already had 18 years of almost continuous programming already. Mm-hmm. Right, and that the fallacy that there is a tabula rasa robot, mm-hmm. right, um, doesn't exist. Um, which comes back to what, what Kiri was talking about with the uh, mm-hmm. with the the avatars, right, or the digital utopia of we're divorced from our identity on the internet. Uh, and and the, I think she cites Nakamura in her mm-hmm. in her book uh, and cyber types and the fallacy of of the digital being universal. Right. Right. Uh, and and, and uh, totally blank, and so um, I'm just uh, the 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 sort of singularity thing becomes that point that tipping point to me. But uh, and I'm sure someone has discussed this far more eloquently than I know of. Um, but this idea of is there such a thing as an autonomous robot in the same way that you know we've been programmed by. Right experience before. Um, I was thinking about this just the other day. So I have, you know, Siri in the car, right. and now I have a three-year-old sitting in the back. <laughs> so it, when he wants to hear a song, I actually have to, I, I make a point of saying, please play, <laughs> and then playing yeah. this song, thank you, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Um, to, yes. to think about that, that, that data really entry, important. right? Yeah. Yeah. There was just the thing about people Trying to teach their kids to be nicer to their um, uh, their assistants yeah. that, that yeah. children are being rude to Alexa yeah. and the <laughs> yeah. own data yeah. assistant, and so there is a whole need yeah. to like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And all the default voices is a female. So we're actually we're over time. So anybody who wants to leave should feel this, uh, this is a fantastic discussion. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, it couldn't be when we're talking about the robot as, as you know this. As you, you, you put in a hunk of metal, right? And, it, and it's like a tie to loss that we're going to, you know. I think there's something interesting about considering um, Sean and I's work on the aesthetic category of cute mm-hmm. and the powerless yeah. um, thing, because I think when you, especially when you think of Zeeb, right? I mean, Zeeb is adorable. I <laughs> love Zeeb's up. I, I love Zeeb's up. I just want to there. Uh, <laughs> but, he, but he, she, Zeeb is cute and powerless, and the projections we put on Zeeb. I think are interesting because we hold the agency with Zeeb always, I think. Right. Even in the way that we approach it as students. I think well, there's a, I'm sorry. No, 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 please jump in. There's actually a, um, uh, and this comes from social science, so there's a, there's a matrix of dehumanization, right? So there are two axes. There's the axi- axis of, of um, competence, mm-hmm. and then there's the um, axis of, of warmth. And so things that are warm but incompetent, that's where we get things that are cute, right? right? And, mm-hmm. and the, so babies, mm-hmm. um, um, infant animals, mm-hmm. right? And then we get things that are, th- to which we do not have warmth but are incompetent. Um, and those are like people who are homeless, right? Our feelings about um, uh, right, incompetence. And then there are people who are competent and warm, right? Favorite coworkers, mm-hmm. right? Friends who help you out, and then there are people uh, who are competent, but uh, but for whom we feel no warmth, right? So those would be like 
you know, people who are highly accomplished in their jobs but, but recognized as jerks. Right. Right, and so it's basically like like our relation. It's like how we understand, right? So we we you know we dehumanize or you know rate the competence, but then how we effectively relate to them. And there's there are there are social science measures and scales of how to assess our relative um, understanding and reactions to to people, things, and and it's particularly interesting in the case of robots of where they land on that scale of competence versus one. Right, because like the delivery bots are just boxes. There's nothing about them that inspires sort of a, a sense of, of connection. I mean, Z has eyes that change and look at you and move. And there's more of a connection in the warmth that you're talking about. And the boxes are just boxes. And they're and the common. vulnerability, too. I mean, you're saying, yeah. the, and, and it, my, by far my favorite moment in Commedia Robotica that I think establishes that connection is when he falls over yeah. the slapstick uh -huh. moment, mm -hmm. which of course came about accidentally, and then you know, so it was a real theater moment too, as they say it happens, and it totally for me humanizes Z, right? That way. but it's by showing his incompetence in trying to be human, is it? He's revealing his robotness, and then he's trying to get up and fall again. So, but I think that is a big, big part of it. Whereas I think the thing about the drones is not just that they're not anthropomorphic. But they're so competent, and they start to, yeah, they, when you start talking about the alarms and all those, it just makes them, makes it infinitely less appealing that it can take care of itself would make me then want to challenge that even more, which is, you know, as opposed to being this vulnerable thing that's going down the street and trying but to it's do also, it. It's also about their relational position too, isn't it? Because I think it's not just the economic and class anxieties, it's this literal vision of a world that you don't matter in at all. Right. The drones have been told to go somewhere else by someone else to take them food in a way that, you know, it makes the streets somewhere you don't understand anymore. I mean, it's like what Mike was saying about where is the robot. It's, the, it's, it's not just that this thing is a robot, it's that something unseen is driving it and people know what that is and they can control it and you don't. And it's right. happening in the street. Jason is wrong. This wrong. might be a bit too revealing of me as a as a parent, but uh, <laughs> my uh, my four year old uh, talks with with uh, Alexa, uh, and you can say Alexa, can we talk? Or Alexa, let's have a discussion, and he's practicing his speaking skills, no question. Uh, there's there's something that's going on there. It's, it's the most adorable thing you've ever seen before. Uh, but and at least at the, on his level, I think she's an equal, no question. And he, she's actually teaching him how to converse. And I don't, I don't. <laughs> so that's what freaks me out. Of but like, but I, I'll just sit, I'll watch for hours and, and watch that conversation happening. I'm not interrupted at all. I'm like, oh my God, what is happening here? Well, we've been married a little bit. Like, I think this is fascinating that you're teaching your child what? to be polite to Alexa, right? Mm -hmm. As a method of teaching your child how to be polite to humanity, right? And someday when your child is ready to learn this, you could explain that Alexa is a conglomeration of other humans who created her, that she herself is not a she and an entity or whatever. She is a conglomeration of non-neutral humans. Like this is what I said yesterday, in my opinion, technology is neutral, but humans are not. So you know, some hum someone's gonna use Facebook to start a wonderful revolution, someone's gonna use it to kill people, et cetera, whatever. But it's an interesting like progression because yeah, your child's learning how to speak and that's great, but to let them understand at some point that Alexa is not a singular entity, but there is a whole collection of other of, of real flesh and blood people. At least at this point, that might change mm -hmm. in the future. You know, it's like a kind of continuum. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so I think this is probably a good awesome. point. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, so we're back tomorrow morning. Is it here? I think it's here again. Uh, I